What's up, guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle for the next episode in our Q and A. It's time to hang out for a little while. I actually I went a little bit light on it last week. I know people were asking about why there was no Q and A and why that didn't happen, and also why there was no review series. I don't know. I feel like we've been a little video log heavy lately. And I don't know. It's been difficult to keep up with it. I have a big backlog of like video logs and things like that that are sort of difficult to intersperse. And so, anyways, I decided to take a week to cool off from like video log related randomness. And so this week we're back on it, we're going to be doing both. I may make the weekend review bi-weekly, just because sometimes there's not a big enough variance in what I'm doing from one week to the next. But I'll keep you posted, I'll let you know that's more of a conversation for the weekend review. Welcome on back to the Q&A, let's go ahead and check this on out. I've got a number of your comments that I've compiled over the course of the last week, and I am ready. Well, not just comments, I mean those are kind of like statements. But anyways, your questions, your queries, your inquiries, and all that kind of fun stuff. The first one! is from Vice Rogue. Hey, Splattercat, do you watch any kind of anime? I'm a little hot and cold with anime, actually. I do watch anime. I've watched all the classics. I like things like Fist of the North Star. I enjoy Dragon Ball Z. I enjoy things like Cowboy Bebop and stuff like that. The very kind of well-made or classic animes. By and large, though, when it comes to newer stuff, I don't watch it very often, simply because anime is a lot like comic books in that it's a really, really expansive subject, and you kind of need a guide or like somebody that's really, really into it to help you figure out like what you should be watching at any given moment. And so randomly I do. Occasionally I watch anime, not very frequently though because it's so hard to find like good ones. Occasionally I'll get a recommendation from a friend of mine or something like that who's really really into anime and that'll help out. But by and large I do watch it, but it's mostly just like the DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff that I have from older series from like the 80s and 90s rather than anything like newer. Wanadina asks, it's a paladin question, ooh I like those. Dear Splattercat, what is it that you like about paladins? Any memorable tabletop experience playing them? Your thoughts on Lawful Stupid? Who's your favorite paladin? What video game has your favorite paladin playstyle archetype? You know, really what it comes down to is I just like the fact that paladins have heavy armor and they still get to cast spells. Most video games and most tabletop games don't really allow you to be like a heavy armor caster most of the time. And so I like paladins for the exact same reason that I like clerics. It's not necessarily the outlook of the character I like, it's just kind of the skill sets. I like anything that has like plate mail and also can use magic. I just enjoy that. And so anyways, my experience with Lawful Stupid is that it's a terrible decision. Lawful Stupid makes your game boring, don't do it. That or it just turns you into that guy in the party that everybody's like, please just walk away. You don't have to do this right now. And he'd be like, no, I am lawful good. Therefore, I must do the right thing always, no matter what, even to the detriment of everybody in this play session. I'm like, no, please, no, please don't be lawful good. Just be chaotic good, it'll be fine, and you can just kind of be a paladin with no magic. You'll just be like a warrior who's also a good guy. I don't know. I like paladins because they can cast spells and they use plate mail, and so I really love heavy armor. Uh, whenever I play an MMO or anything else, I always go with heavy armor. I like the fact that they can cast magic, though, too. And so anyways, what video game has my favorite paladin playstyle? I'd actually say I like clerics a little bit better, but I would say D&D &D with- I like clerics in D&D because &D they're, like, heavily armored and they're able to, like, wail on shit. And then, I guess, I like Paladins in World of Warcraft as well, the guys with the silver hand or whatever. I know that they've fallen away from the lore recently, but I like them just because they get a lot of badass holy magic that, like, cuts people in half and shit. But they still get to have the super awesome, like, flowy tabard armor and whatnot. Marco Magano asks, Bear Grylls has taught us that in a desert survival situation, it's perfectly safe to eat scorpions and or snakes. Once they've been properly prepared, the best part is when you sprinkle the scorpion on the snake before each bite. Almost like, I don't know, like a salsa, you take the snake and you dip it in the scorpion goo. Anyways, would you ever partake of these delicacies in the same situation? I've had bark scorpion, which is what we have here in California. Cut the tail off one one time and ate it because I was curious. I think I saw Liz Stroud do it or something like that. I was like, I'm gonna eat myself a scorpion. The legs are a little weird. They don't stop moving like you would expect them to. They got kind of like a weird, vegetably gross flavor. They're, they're not delicious. They really aren't. They got like a weird vegetable flavor. But it's like vegetables that are slightly off. I've had snake plug as well, but I got that at a store and kind of like, it wasn't like a beef jerky. It came on like a canned thing. It was like canned snake. And so anyways, I've had it. They're pretty good. It's not bad. It's about as good as you would expect it to be. I guess it kind of depends on your open mind. I always say this, but I'm going to add that gator is the most delicious meat I've ever had in my entire life. So if you ever get the chance, you should definitely eat alligator. Kaylee Lepertry says, What's up with Weekend Review? I noticed you don't do it every week now, so what's up with that, pimp? Well, what it comes down to is sometimes like we don't vary the series or anything, and I feel like I've already given my thoughts about the series that we're currently running and things like that. Additionally, I've just been like a malaise lately, and so my mood has just been sour. And I try to stay away from a microphone or a camera when I'm sour. 
So anyways, I might make it like bi-weekly because every two weeks there's definitely going to be something new to talk about or whatever. But every week, sometimes I feel like we play a game and I can talk about the way that it's developing and the things that I like and don't like. But the next week we're still playing that game and I'm just like, well, I can give you the same thoughts that I already gave you or we can just not do it. I don't know. It's in a weird place right now because it's Patreon backed. It's all taken care of on there. So I know I need to do it. It's just I need to get it in a place where it fits and it feels a little bit more natural. Christopher Smith says, I present my question to you henceforth. What advice would you give to a first time Shadowrun GM? Are there things I should include? Are there things that I should stay away from? That's actually a really, really huge question because there are people that have spent the better part of their lives learning to GM in a way that is entertaining for the player because a lot of people can GM. I mean, GMing is as simple as just putting encounters in front of the player and then stringing them together with some sort of narrative. But the really, really good GMs can make like full book-like stories that are absolutely fascinating that keep people gripped to the table until six in the morning when they have work at eight o'clock and things like that. I've had a couple of D&D games that were just like that where the story was just so good where I was like, dude, how did you write this? And he was like, well, I was reading this book and I was reading this book and I sort of mixed these themes together. So anyways, come up with a rough idea. I think that it's always a good idea to have kind of like a rival for Shadowrunners, just somebody to come along and mess with them every now and again. Someone that they can touch, but they can't really touch. Like that person that like beats them to the punch occasionally. Someone for them to hate, someone to drive them forward. With shadow running, you always want to make sure that things are a little bit deeper than skin as well. So I mean, you don't want the story to just be like on the surface. You don't want it to be fluff. When the players get to a location, so let's say that they get a mission to go out and like steal a thing. It can be that simple where you're just supposed to go in and steal a thing. But really what you want to think about as a GM is who is hiring the Johnson to then hire the Shadowrunners to get the thing. Why does he want the thing? Does anybody else want the thing? What is the function of the thing? You've got to work around all these things because once you start thinking about the actual function form and who wants this, why they want it, you want to come up with all the questions surrounding whatever it is the Shadowrunners are trying to accomplish. So then you can come up with other people in the narrative that also want that object or you can double cross the players at the table which they always love. They'll always just be like, no! And you can double cross them because there's other interested parties and things like that. There's a lot of ways that you could do it. There's a lot of ways that you could do it. But honestly, I would say to read the GM manuals, I would go online. There's a lot of Shadowrun communities and things like that with specific forums only for GMs or guys that are interested in GMing. And you can kind of partake of the experience of the guys that have been doing GMing since like the 70s and stuff like that. There are guys out there and ladies that have been making storylines and things like that for upwards of 30, 40 years. And you can't pay for that kind of experience. And a lot of these guys are more than willing to just give it away on internet forums and teach you how to do this actually very important skill if you ever plan on being a tabletop GM. I see this so Loki that's asks, probably what I would Hey, right Splattercat, there. I got a question for you. Since I really loved your Warhammer LPs and you seem to be a fan yourself, from the 10 Warhammer games which are announced for 2015 and 2016, which are you most anticipating and which ones do you think are the best? And if so, which one do you consider for making an LP? Uh, I I'm really excited about Eternal Crusade. I do want to play that. We're probably going to play, I think there's one coming out that's going to be called 40k Death Watch or something like that. Looks sort of interesting. We've also got Total Warhammer coming out. I'm not a big fan of Total War, but I'll probably check out Total Warhammer just to check it. I mean, it's run by Sega, so Sega's always a little sketchy when you do LPs. They're one of those no-no companies that you got to be nervous about. But anyways, I'd say we'll probably do a Total Warhammer series. We'll more than likely do a Death Watch series. We'll more than likely do an Eternal Crusade series, like maybe once a week with fans or something like that. Other than that, I wasn't aware of much else aside from like Regis side, but that was just chess with Warhammer, so I wasn't really that interested in it. Those are my thoughts. Cubini asks, hey Splat, what's your favorite turn-based strategy? I would say Final Fantasy Tactics or maybe Fallout 2. Those would be the two that are the most memorable for me. I think the Final Fantasy Tactics is probably one of the most perfect turn-based games ever made, just in terms of content density and just the, I guess the repeatability of being able to play the game over and over and over again. It's a very, very cool little game. It has its flaws, but you know, he also follows by saying his favorite was Front Mission 3 and asking if I've ever played it. I did. Front Mission 3 was the one on PlayStation where you could get on the internet and whatnot. I remember that one. Front Mission 3, I think, was the first one I ever played, and then I went back and I played 1 and 2 after I played the third one. I think that was the initial one that introduced me to the series. I've always liked mecha games, though. Anything like Mech Warrior or, you know, I like... Well, they got metal... They got... Anything like Mech Warrior. I like Battletech. I like just about anything Chrome Hounds. I really, really like. I tend to like the bigger mechs, though. Like the anime-styled mechs that are super fast and, like, agile and stuff. I don't really get in on that. I like the mechs that are just like, Rah! and they're just these big hulking things of metal that just, like, lope around, and they move very slowly, and they're like, boom, boom, boom. It's badass. I like those better. Anthony Pointer has a simple question. He says, what is your favorite food? 
I like Tortellini. I like Lao Lao. I enjoy Shabu Shabu. I really, honestly, I'm easy to please though. Like, we can just go with pizza here and that would pretty much fix everything. I could eat pizza all day, every day, as long as it's from a place that doesn't suck. Zach Hoggard asks, Say, Splat, do you play guitar? If so, what would be your advice to a newbie? Play a lot. I mean, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Most of the people I know, including myself, who played guitar for a living for a while and who made money doing it, with, from the day we got our guitar, we played it like six or seven hours a day. Like, we played it so much that, like, our fingers would cramp and they would just hurt all the time. And that's how you know you have a passion for the instrument. If you just want to play it as a hobby, practice an hour or two a day. If you want to be really, really good at it, though, it's going to have to, like, dominate your time. I played from the age of 13 to about 22. I probably played guitar about between four and seven hours a day. I would just sit there and play guitar. Even while I was watching things on TV, I would just run through scales, but I wouldn't pick. I would just move my fingers. Other times I would do pick exercises for like precision picking and things like that while just holding the frets down so it wouldn't make a noise. Things of that nature. Practice your scales. Make sure you know all the basic chords so that when people check you on it, you know how to do it. Little things like that. It's not too hard. You just got to spend a lot of time doing it. It's like anything else. Practice, practice, practice. Dale B asks, Hey, I like your videos and you do a good job, so keep up the good work. Thank you. I appreciate that. While watching your videos, you made reference to Tabletop a few times, which has intrigued me into maybe picking it up. My question is, what advice, pointers, or tips would you give to someone or tell them to keep in mind and think about when playing their first few games? Well, this kind of ties into the, the GM question that we had earlier, but if you're going to be a player, I would say that the number one thing you need to work on is not metagaming. There's nothing worse than a player at your table. So if you don't know what metagaming is, essentially when you're playing a tabletop game, you're supposed to be role playing. You're not supposed to be power gaming or anything like that. I mean, you can play it how you want, but make sure that it meshes with the way that your group wants to play. To my mind, when you play things like D&D and Shadowrun, from the moment I sit down at the table, I'm in character. And so I think like my character would, and I take the things that happen in my character's backstory, and I also use those things as a reference point for how my character would behave in accordance with alignment and things of that nature. And so one of the big things you gotta watch out for, and I think one of the major things that a lot of players stumble over, is the thing called metagaming, where you're playing your character like you're playing a video game character. And that becomes troublesome, because when a, or when a character plays like that, let's assume that two people in your group go off and talk about something, Sure, you're sitting at the table and you can hear them discussing what they're talking about, the subject at hand, but they're outside the room in terms of in-game stuff. And what a lot of players do is they'll try and steer themselves into that clandestine meeting somehow or by... Because they know as a player that they had that conversation on the side, they will then try to steer their character over there to kind of make them uncover information that they shouldn't know about or acting on a hunch that they shouldn't know about. And so one of the big things you want to steer away from is metagaming. Nobody likes that at the table. When you're in character, you're in character. At least that's how we always play at my table. So anyways, that's just my opinion. Metagame players and power gamers, eh, not a big fan of having them at the table. I'd really just prefer to make this a storyline type thing. But be in character and just do your best to play into the narrative that everybody else is forming. Nobody likes somebody that busts up the narrative by trying to interject themselves into everything interesting that happens. The GM should take care of that. Everybody should be involved in one way or another so long as the GM is doing his job. So, you know, don't lose faith. You'll be included eventually if your GM knows what he's doing. But it's a fun hobby. You should definitely give it a go. But try not to metagame. That would be the biggest one because it takes a lot of people a lot of time to sort of get out of that mindset of being themselves versus acting like their character would. Joe Jacobs asks, Good day. What would you do if you were offered a professional chef to cook meals for you at your home? Oh, I'd probably be wasteful. I don't know. That sort of extravagance doesn't work on me. I, I, And I don't mean that I wouldn't appreciate it or anything like that. But what I mean is that, I don't know. I've become a little bit minimalist as I've gotten older. Like, when I was younger, I wanted to be rich, and I wanted to be a baller, and I wanted to have, like, Rolexes and all kinds of nice stuff and just, you know, have everything taken care of and just have, like, extravagance and stuff like that. Nowadays, I naturally sort of recoil from that kind of stuff, and I don't really know why. I can't explain why I do. It just seems like a bit much to me. So, honestly, I have primitive tastes anyways. I eat Captain Crunch, like, 30 times a day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, so you might as well give it to somebody whose palate will appreciate it a little bit better. <laughs> Brandon Parnell asks, Hey, Splat, do you prefer games about the ocean or space? Probably space, although I think ocean and space both have kind of the same themes, especially given the fact that in order to sustain life underwater, we would need to use some kind of sci-fi. In addition, ocean settings, very hostile outside to human beings without the proper gear. Space is the exact same way, so I think both settings share a lot of the same themes. 
but I think I would go for space unless I really really liked what they did with Bioshock because in that way they managed to tie together like sci-fi and the ocean in a way where it still felt very sort of like art deco is that the word that I'm looking for either way it felt very much like it was futuristic and sci-fi ish while at the same time set at the bottom of the ocean in like the 1920s or whatever it was a cool game and so anyways I like space better unless the ocean game does something very very unique in order to tie me into it like Bioshock did Cameron Long asks I noticed that you have a Rubik's Cube in the background I see it isn't solved did you get frustrated by it and quit no I actually I didn't even bother I got it for my grandma's always getting me little knickknacks and things like that because my granddad was really into puzzles and stuff of that nature and so she's always getting me puzzles and things and sometimes I fiddle with them for a while with the Rubik's Cube it's just been sitting there I put it over there and I keep meaning to sit down and mess with it but I just haven't that's pretty much all that there is to it Diablosion asks hey splat my question is I heard you're from a religious background but you yourself are not religious my question is do you believe in an afterlife of any sort my answer to that is going to be a little bit peevish, or I guess a little bit of like a squirrely answer. So, the first way that I would look at it is I would like there to be an afterlife, but here's the thing. It's tough to imagine in any case that we just cease to exist after we die, because as a human being, among all the ways that we define ourselves as a human being, or as a person, or as an individual, the first thing is that all these are rooted in the fact that we exist. And so I know that I exist right here and while you know, philosophically I suppose you could argue about it or make like matrix arguments or whatever else There'd be no way to prove that like we're not an AI like simulation running out or anything like that There's no way there's a lot of interesting arguments there, but setting that aside I exist The foundations of my rea reality are all based upon the fact that like I've had these experiences I've cataloged them away. I know that I've existed and I've interacted with the world this way that way and whatever and so because everything is perceptional for a human, it's weird to think about the fact that someday we would be the lack of perception. Like it would all just be gone and it would almost be like when you're asleep sans dreams. Like you know when you go to sleep and it's just like there's no dream, it's just like black and you just shut down and then your alarm goes off and you wake up. I figure it's probably something like that if there is no afterlife. It's just like you don't even know you're dead or whatever. So it's probably not anything to worry about. It'd be nice if there was like an afterlife or something that happened after we all keel off or whatever. But I just don't know. I just don't know. I guess we'll all have to figure out someday. Isn't that a dark thought? <laughs> Anyways, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. I realize it got a little bit weird in there, and I'm not even sure if I said anything of value. But yeah, I'd like there to be, but I can't prove that there will be or anything like that. I mean, if I would prefer that there is, I mean, it'd be cool to continue existing. I'd like to think that I would continue existing in one form or another, even if it's as like a ghostly observer, like haunting a place and like knocking over stuff and scaring little kids under their bed like, ah, 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 ah. like so anything would be better than nothing, I would figure. But maybe there would be sort of like a relaxing softness to nothing, so who knows? I guess we'll sort the destination out once we get there. Quaz Zen asks, if you were granted a single wish, what would you use it on? And you can't just wish for more wishes, so there's like Aladdin genie rules here. A single wish, huh? You know, my initial response was just to wish that nobody would be unhappy anymore and that people would be, like, fulfilled and satisfied. But honestly, I think that life is defined, like, you can't really appreciate the good times in life unless you have, like, those lows and the bad times. Because those are what make, like, the triumphs and the victories feel so much better. Is because you know what it feels like to drag your foot on the bottom of the lake and it feels so good to come up for air afterwards. But honestly, I don't know. I think I would just wish that people would have enough to get by and not be hungry and not you know, die and go without and things like that. A lot of poverty and just like sadness in the world. And I realize economically there's no way that that would work. Like there's no way to make everybody have everything that they need. Like there's always gonna be limited supply and things like that. But if by some wonderful genie magic, I could just like make poverty stop. Like I'm not saying everybody would be rich. I'm not even saying that everybody would be like middle class or whatever, but just like people wouldn't go to bed hungry. Little kids would be able to go on their field trips and stuff without having to worry about their parents not being able to afford it. Like, you know, just people would have enough money for the bare essentials, like food, water, and the maintenance of family. I don't know, something like that if it could even be done outside the bounds of economics and the things that I know there. It's just, I don't know. It's a tough one. It's a very tough one because you want to be selfish about it. Like, the first goal, like, when somebody asks you if you could have a wish, you start running through your head of, like, all the things that you could just do for yourself. And I'd like to think that I could really resist that temptation given the opportunity. I don't know. I guess that would be the moment that you would find out if you're a bad person or not. <laughs> like really truly like dive down to the bottom of your soul and figure out if you were just like the worst person ever You just use the wish on yourself super selfishly without doing anything for the world Or I guess you could use the wish on yourself to make yourself like insanely wealthy And then you could spend the rest of your life doing altruistic stuff But I don't know I just don't think that I have the time the willpower or the strength to make that work So I figured I would just go with what I already said 
Dylan Arruda says, Chewbacca or Groot and why? Go. Uh, Chewbacca. I like Chewbacca better. There's kind of like a naive stupidity about Groot that I just can't stand. I don't know, dumb, cute characters that are like dumb, naive, and they have like the best intentions. I've never liked those sorts of characters. I like Chewbacca because at the end of the day, Chewbacca is a straight G. He carries a gun with him everywhere that he goes. He's always down for his team. At the same time, he's got his mink on everywhere that he rides out to. Nobody can tell what he's saying any of the time, but you know most of it is threatening. I like Chewbacca. I'm down with Chewbacca. Chewbacca seems like the sort of friend that, like, if you were at work and somebody was super shit-talking you and you couldn't do anything about it because you would get fired and you, like, need the money for rent and Chewbacca was there, like, just hanging out at your work talking with you, like, he would punch the guy because you can't. You'd be like, yeah, Chewbacca. He held it down. So I think Chewbacca would be better. Jesus Christ asks... Boobs or butts? That's an easy one. I would just go with butts. Just booty, 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 rocking everywhere. That's the answer to that question. Slarty Bartfar says, out of Batman and Superman, who do you think would win? Batman and Superman is a tough question because I think it's really a question of preparation. So here's the thing. Batman usually wins because he's prepared and he does his research. And before the threat arrives, he's already got it taken care of before the other threat knows that it's even engaged with him. This has been covered a lot in the comics, but I really sincerely think that Batman would win if he had the prep time. Like, if Batman knew that Superman was coming, he is good. Like, there's no way that Superman stands a chance. He's done for, because Batman is just a master of preparation. However, if they were just, like, walking down the street talking about Cold Stone Creamery or something, and Superman was just like, no, and just, like, jumped him, Batman's toast. There's no way. Now, you can make the argument that because Batman is always prepared for everything, he's made, like, a battle kit for all of the guys he hangs out with in the Justice League and whatever else. You can make that argument that every time he makes a new friend, he comes up with, like, a kill kit for them. But I don't know. I think that in the absence of preparation, like, if Superman just jumped Batman, Batman would be in deep, deep shit. But if Batman knew that Superman had gone rogue, I think that Superman's about to get toasted. Although I always thought there'd be a strong argument to be made that no matter how much kryptonite or whatever Superman, I'm sorry, that Batman had, if Superman could just get up to, like, a high speed and then just crash into Batman, like, just get his trajectory right so that he crashed into Batman at, like, light speed or whatever before Batman could even use any of his gizmos on him. So the impact would probably kill him anyways, and it'd kind of be like bowling for Batman. So I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm sure it'll keep nerds arguing for years to come, but that would be my take on it. Michael Myers asks, please come back to film. I would love it if you would come back to film, Michael Myers. Please don't murder any more people either. Also, how do you like your eggs? Hmm... Over easy, over medium, over hard, doesn't really matter to me. I'm easy to please when it comes to food. When I was growing up, you kind of just ate whatever was there and didn't complain about it, and that's bled over into my, like the rest of my life. I can eat just about anything and not complain about it, so it doesn't even matter. Makes me very, very easy to prepare food for. That's going to be the end of our Q&A. That's all the questions that I've got for the day. If I didn't get yours, please post it down below again. The Q&A is thusly concluded. My name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here for this Friday series. I will have another one for you next week. I will preen all of the comments from below. This time I'm going to try and organize it a little bit better by putting a question down below. So people that have comments, you can post your comments, but people that have questions can reply to my comments. Somebody suggested that in the last video, and I think that's a pretty nice, elegant way to get the whole thing cleaned up. I will see you all next week don't forget to check out all the links that i have down below if you want to support the channel patreon and loot crate are the ways to get it done i'll see you next time hi do everybody